Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Doreen Cumberford, and I am one of the co-hosts of the podcast and show Nomadic Diaries. Today's reading is just a short um, reading from Life in the Camel Lane, Embrace the Adventure, a book I uh, published uh, three years ago. And this is part of the National Podcasting Month uh, promotion. So today I'm going to read a little bit about weddings. Um, weddings were one of the wonderful differences in Saudi Arabia that was very obvious to us. And so the t this is chapter nine from Life in the Camel Lane, Weddings as Cultural Education. Saudi weddings are major cultural events marked markedly different in perspective and ceremony from other cultures. The contrast between the expat and Saudi experience engenders much curiosity, and therefore anyone receiving an invitation to a Saudi celebration felt like an honored guest. Linda's family arrived in Dharan in September 1980. That was about four or five decades ago, right? She was fortunate enough to be invited to, to enjoy a memorable Saudi wedding. Linda had met Jafar, a cheerful Shiite, at the dining hall. He had worked for Aramco since 1946 when he was 12 years old. He learned to speak English well and built good relationships across cultures. He also was willing to discuss local politics, which were normally a taboo subject in what was an isolated parochial culture in the 1980s, with little exposure to the outside world. Jafar was different. Linda had heard descriptions of Saudi weddings from other expats and had always wanted to attend one. For months, Jafar primed her that she would be invited to his family's next wedding. One day, that phone call arrived. Wedding bells, Saudi style. In traditional country weddings back then, the celebrations were complete when the groom showed up at the bride's home to claim her. Stories abounded about people being stranded in a Saudi home for several days, wondering if the groom had got cold feet or was rejoicing with his pals so long that he didn't want to break up the party. Saudi parties can last for several days. Jafar, like so many Saudis, had two wives residing in the same house with five children from each. One of his older children was studying in the United States. Like so many Saudis, he quickly built an affinity with Americans. However, he was unable to reassure Linda as to how long the wedding would be. He gave her the typical inshallah response, meaning the time and conclusion of the celebrations would remain unpredictable. He did reassure her that she would not be alone. Other Westerners would be present. She dressed in a sparkly caftan and evening sandals. Since no men would be present, she could show her arms. She wore gold jewelry, as is the custom even in the most modest of households. Jafar picked Linda up. She was covered for the drive, and they drove out the security gates of Daharan, entering a different world. This wedding was a typical country wedding and would be held in the large Shiite suburb of Katif. They pulled up in front of a walled clay and concrete house. Jafar deposited her outside the gate where she made her way up to an open door. Linda appeared inside. No one was there. Finally, someone came from another room and greeted her in Arabic. Linda Harrit handed her the wedding gift, and the gal's smile revealed some missing teeth. Linda said, I was compelled to follow my own wedding traditions, removing some beautiful copper leaves from my living room wall and wrapping them in wedding paper. 
But who really knows if the bride ever received them or if the hostess kept them? The woman said, Shukran, and motioned to Linda to follow her upstairs onto the roof. A rather large group of women in long, colorful dresses milled about quietly, spotting three or four expatriate women who clearly stood out and were also Jeffers' special friends. Linda made her way over to them. They chatted, got to know one another, and speculated about the timing and what might be next. This was a very alien happening for these Westerners. They even wondered aloud how they would recognize the bride. Along one wall was a velour chair, perhaps a car seat, on a carpeted platform. It seemed to be a place of honor. A group of women in abayas showed up looking for a space to set down their drums. They selected a corner, removed their abayas, and sat cross-legged on the roof. One of the expats presumed they were the local band hired from a neighboring village to play for the celebration. Some very old women sitting down were smoking from hookah pipes. The drums started and rhythms got faster. Saudi women started dancing, the tempo quickened, and they started throwing their heads around, flinging their long hair from side to side, backward and forward. Linda was surprised at the seductive nature of the dancing and thought, all this energy for other women? This was followed by high-pitched ululating from women all over the rooftop. This was becoming a more ge National Geographic experience moment by moment. One of the British women joined the dancing and Linda followed suit. It wasn't long before she too was consumed by the primal rhythms and throwing her hair about. The night was sweltering hot and sweat poured down her back. The Saudi women seemed pleased with Linda's dancing and urged her on by ululating and clapping. The musicians, all old women, smiled their stained and missing teeth evident, then played even faster. Linda transformed into a whirling dervish. Later, she realized that Jaffer had provided his family with entertainment in the form of the expats. It was not simply a kind gesture to be invited. It was actually a calculated move. The foreigners became the highlight of the evening. When Linda ceased dancing, the onlookers were disappointed. The music subsided at 11 o'clock. Then the bride appeared in a long pastel dress and a rhinestone tiara and was escorted to the velour seat. She started to read from the Quran. Women proceeded to bring out bolts of fabric and unfurl them in front of her. The spreading of fabric ensued for a while prior to food, arriving on simple aluminium trays about three feet wide. With no choice but to sit down on the hot rooftop to eat, Linda and her new expat friends joined the Saudi women, who seemed perfectly comfortable with extreme heat. Fresh goat meat was served. No doubt the animal had been killed that day, then prayed over. The rice that accompanied the meat was uniquely Saudi Arabian and delicious. Everyone eats with the right hand, the left hand being considered unclean. Tea was served in small handleless cups. Sliced oranges were passed around, dinner was complete, and calmer drumming ensued. They had danced, the bride had made her grand appearance, and finally they had eaten. The only item of business left was for the appearance of the groom to claim his bride. By now, it was well after midnight, and the expat women were sleepy. During the hotter months, especially decades ago, Saudi women rested or slept during the day. They tended to be more active during the night when it is cooler. By this time, the expats were wondering when they would get off the rooftop. They had seemingly exhausted all mutual interests and became subdued. 
one hour stretched into the next. They observed the band gathering their interest and noticed the bride was gone. Finally, the sign that the wedding was over. Though the groom hadn't presented himself to the woman, he had come for her downstairs and apparently they were already off on their new life together. Linda recalls arriving home at 4 a.m. The question is, was she set up to be the evening's entertainment in the form of an expat performance? Or was she truly an honored and special guest? Perhaps the answer lies in yes and yes. Clearly, this was an example of how the Saudi culture was neither straightforward and things were seldom as they ever appeared. Country wedding. Michelle worked as a nurse in Saudi Aramco clinics. She made friends with the local population easily and mentored several local gals through their nursing training. One gal was a Shiite and invited Michelle to their family home in Alhassa for a family member's nuptials. This was Michelle's first Saudi wedding. It was a country wedding with simple village people, not a formal high society wedding. Michelle went to the women's tent and was struck by how much the women dressed up for each other. These exotic creatures emerged from their abayas to entertain each other with plenty of cleavage and dripping jewels. Amazing music was created from drumming on large drinking bottles. Several women stood on tables and performed belly dancing. This wedding also started around 11 p.m. and continued until the wee hours. Michelle remembers getting a glimpse into a village hovel and by the light of a lamp seeing two families with the bride and groom plus a mullah. She guessed they were signing the dowry papers. Later, dancing commenced. When the groom arrived to claim his bride, the women rushed in a great flurry for their abayas to cover themselves. The bride and groom sat on a makeshift thrones while a greeting line of family and friends formed. Later, they all went back to the bride's family house. The couple went up to the bedroom and the entire family waited for them to exit the bedroom. When they did, everyone cheered, jumped for joy and applauded. By now, they were family members, and immediate family members could remove their abayas. Michelle recalls that wedding as an authentically alien experience that demonstrated the very raw nature of the culture. Unintended consequences. Michelle also recalls working in the clinic the night that many women and girls were brought from a fire in a wedding tent. Someone had brought sparklers that set the tent on fire and it had only one exit. The women were dressed provocatively and refused to exit the tent without their abayas. Panic ensued and the burning tent collapsed on more than a hundred women and children. Many died that night and Michelle cared for several of the wounded women at the hospital. It was a tragic night. I recall the events from the news the following days, together with the uh, resulting outrage and grief that we Westerners felt for those women and girls who were trapped. While we could wrap our minds around how it could happen, it was almost impossible to wrap our, reds, our heads around why it happened. So this is just a few memories from weddings. There will be another excerpt from weddings, but just to give you a little taste of life in the Camel Lane. If you've enjoyed this reading and you are either an expat, a traveling family, a short or long-term expat or a digital nomad, um, someone who's living and traveling overseas, we welcome you to Nomadic Diaries. Please, Join us, like, share, and tell your friends. Thank you. Bye-bye.